economic update. I'll repeat that. I want to thank everyone for joining today. This is our quarterly economic update. Um, and we do this the first month of each quarter where we can recap sort of what happened in the previous quarter and um, look ahead as well to say, you know, what do we anticipate in the quarters that come? So with this being the beginning of the year, we'll kind of look back on um, all of 2023 and then really kind of think about what is it that we're watching for 2024. Um, on the months that we don't have the economic updates, we do still have webinars and those vary in topics. We recently did one that was um, long-term care. Um, we have one coming up that's part of our family preparedness series, and that's where we're going to talk about what happens when a loved one passes away. A lot of us have done estate planning. We maybe have um, all of our ducks in a row, but really talk about that, like what actually happens when someone passes in the process of um, putting all of that in motion that you've done so much planning around. Um, so we hope that you'll be able to join us for some of those. Um, a couple of other updates in our office. We um, unfortunately did lose a team member. Andrew moved further north and is um, no longer part of our organization. So if you're working with Andrew, you can reach out to any other team member in his absence, but just wanted to make sure that we were passing that information along. And I've had a lot of people asking me about Norma. She um, is still working here, but she's working part-time as she helps care for a family member. Um, and so you might not always see her in the office. Um, she is still here and is missing everyone. So um, continue to ask and then we'll, we'll pass along the, the good wishes. Um, today, I'm gonna introduce you to Kezia Samuel. Kezia is um, one of the partners that we have at AssetMark. She's the Vice President of Investment Consulting. And um, she really helps to oversee a lot of the economic um, and research side of what's happening in the investment world for asset mark. So I'm gonna turn the conversation over to her. We are in an listen only mode. So if you do have questions, please put them in the Q and A box. And um, uh, both Casey and myself are gonna monitor that and make sure we get to all of them. But um, with that, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, turn it over to you, Casey. Thank you, Lindsay. I'm still in the mode of saying happy new year. I'm actually taking it all the way to February 2nd. So happy new year to all those that have joined today. Uh, welcome to 2024. Let me see, share my screen as well as I walk through and make this bigger. Okay, so today we're gonna do in the next uh, 25 to 30 minutes is, as you can see, the title of today's presentation is New Year and Quality Resolutions. Now each year we begin the year with making resolutions that seems to be part of the norm as we shift from closing out the last year's chapter and starting a new one. But I'd like us to be more informed about what has taken place and what are we watching for such that we could make more quality resolutions. I think about the time a few years ago when I was quite ambitious and I said I wanted to climb uh, Mount Everest. Well, I know that's a bit uh, out of my reach, let's say, but so this year I would like to make much more reasonable uh, goals that are uh, much more achievable. And that's the objective here is to walk through what what we know about the markets, what do we know about the economies, helping all of you make quality resolutions as it relates to your particular investment portfolios. With that, today's agenda, we'll take a look at 2023, what's happened in the markets, and then we're going to look forward and address two key questions. The first is remains on inflation. Can we get to what the Federal Reserve is targeting, which is 2% inflation? Where are we relative to that? The second big question is on the economic front, are we in for the economy to continue the growth that we have seen or are we in a recession or are we going to get one? How do we uh, end that debate and what do we see here currently? So we'll talk about that. And then the last segment is going to be around as we enter 2024, what do we see as opportunities and risks for investors. With that, let me start with a look back onto 2023 and how the markets did. Now, 2023, before we look at the numbers, I'm reminded of uh, one of my dear mentors, which was Charlie Munger, who was the business partner of Warren Buffett, uh, passed away in 2023, uh, had a great deal of sayings that meant quite a bit to me as I was growing up in my investment career. But one of them that stood out to me that I think relates to how 2023 ended and how investors potentially uh, may have experienced it. And that saying is, you know, 
wealth creation is not in the buying and selling, but rather in the waiting. And as I think about 2023 and where it ended, that saying has quite a bit of weight to it. Had we used 2022, which looks like the mirror image of the numbers that you see on screen today for 2023, and used 2022 to make an investment decision, you likely may have missed some of the rally that we saw in the markets, which surprised many investors. And it came quite late in the year after having been through quite a volatile period of time. What do we see on the screen here? On the far left-hand side, you can see global equities were up nearly 23%, which is made up of stocks in the US, which took the lead, followed by stocks in Europe and in Japan. And then last but not least, stocks in emerging markets were held back. They were positive, but held back in comparison to the US and the European stock market. A globally diversified 60-40 is up 16%. Again, a sharp contrast to where 2023, 2022 stood as the stock and the bond markets made its recovery in 2023. You also saw the REITs market made a sharp comeback in the last three months as interest rates were projected to be lower out in 2024, thus benefiting the real estate segment of the investment world as well. In fact, the only thing with negative returns are commodities as a result of softer demand, especially coming from China, which has had a bit of a challenge in its economic landscape, took commodities broadly lower. Again, these returns look like a mirror image to where 2022 was in comparison to how 2023 ended. Now, if you look at this, you may say, this looks like a magical year, but some of you may also be thinking about, this doesn't quite look like my portfolio's returns. And one of the reasons why is the next slide. When we look through the markets, and as I stated, in the global stock market, which is made up of US stocks, stocks in Europe and in developed countries like Japan and last but not least emerging markets, the US stocks took the lead. But in the US stock market, we had this big wide dis uh, dispersion in where the returns came from. We are calling this the Magnificent Seven and those are the stocks that dominated the returns in 2023. If I looked at the year, one of the things that was dominant in its theme was artificial intelligence. ChatGPT, which I'm not sure was part of our normal vocabulary until 2023, certainly made um, its forefront in the uh, technological space, but also potentially a disruptor in regards to how productive artificial intelligence was going to be across a variety of different industries. I use ChatGPT, which is sort of the think for itself Google version of things uh, as an example of how it exploded onto mainstream stage in 2023. But regardless, if you look at this uh, chart here, the dark blue line represents the S&P 500. The golden line are these golden seven stocks that truly benefited from artificial intelligence. And those stocks were up 75%. The S&P 500, as you can see through December 15th, was up 22, but the balance of the 493 stocks were up only 12%. In fact, if you were to look one step further and look at companies that have heavy dividend payers. So many of you may have portfolios that are made up of stocks that are classic, not so technologically overweight, and or are the blue chip companies that have paid a steady dividend. Those stocks were completely out of favor. In fact, they were flat, meaning zero and or even negative. What we see is that nearly 30% of the stock markets potentially had negative returns in the S&P, despite the index itself ending on a banner year overall. So the key message from this slide is that one, yes, the S&P had a strong year, but it was driven by a handful of stocks. And two, when you look at your personal returns and you're trying to tie it out to what you may be seeing on the screen, it may not equate. Why? Because select portion of the stock market, such as dividend payers, did not participate in the rally as it was all focused on the technology and the artificial intelligence side of things. 
The other side of the equation is for many, again, conservative investors who may have bonds in their portfolio, what you may not have seen is how much volatility existed in the marketplace. Now, I call this chart as the emotional chart that tracks all of our uh, emotional state. In the green line is the stock market's volatility as measured by something called the VIX index. So as that line goes up, the stock market becomes more volatile, starts to move around quite a bit. And as it comes down, the markets tends to get calm. You can see the blue line sort of trended downwards, especially towards the end of the year as the market's rally got stronger. So it kind of moves in the opposite direction. But the green line, which we often just don't discuss because bonds are typically boring investments until the Fed Reserve, Federal Reserve started raising interest rates. The green line tracks the volatility in the bond market. And you can see in 2023, it stood eight times higher than where the stock market volatility ended at. Typically, over the last three decades, bond market volatility is supposed to be and has been five times below the stock market. So what we saw was the bond markets, yes, it ended the year on a positive note, but it certainly was not without the volatility, especially as the Fed was figuring out what's next for inflation and where should we take interest rates. The key message though of this is, yes, it has been a bumpy ride for bonds, but just when you give up, this is where opportunities abound. Just as the stock market, when it is down, that's when we as portfolio managers get excited. Similarly, in the bond landscape, today we see greater opportunities than what we have not been able to find over the last decade or so. Now, that's the look back onto the markets. It's only as good as understanding what has happened in your statements. Let's take a look going forward. And to do that, let's start with the inflation question. I'm going to look at inflation in a slightly different way. And when we talk about inflation, the latest inflation reading shows that inflation is growing at 3.4%. It has come off the worst at 9.1%. But when you say these numbers, it doesn't really quite give you a feel for it. So what we have done here is X-rayed inflation in three different ways of how we spend money. And let's see if that makes it more relatable to us. The darkest line is stuff we buy, durable goods. And an example is used cars. You can see that dark blue line sat at nearly 15% and since then, in fact, has fallen below the 0%, meaning examples of the used car, which previously a year plus ago, where you had to pay MSRP plus, you no longer have to do that. We are seeing durable goods like used cars actually see falling prices. Why? Because at some point investors went, enough, I'm not doing it because it costs too much. And those types of goods have actually seen falling prices. Add to that the supply chain issues that got resolved through time has also helped that. So that's the dark blue line. The next way we spend money is what we call as non-durable. So think like food and energy. And you can see the light blue line it also has fallen, but then recently ticked up. I don't know about you, but when I go to the grocery store and I come out of the grocery store, I'm always, I'm still shocked by the cost of high prices, especially for food. And that you can see food and energy as it ticked the bottom, but now has started to rise again. So this side of the uh, equation of how we spend money has not necessarily seen the same falling prices as let's say the washing machine or the used car. So this part of the inflation is still being sticky. And the last is the orange line. The third way we spend money is by going out and enjoying services in the economy. And for this, I'm gonna use an example of, let's think about a restaurant. In a restaurant, the biggest cost for them are two front wages, of the employees that they have to keep. And second is rental equivalent. And you can see, in fact, of all three things, services has been the slowest moving downwards. And so this is where we think, yes, the worst of inflation is behind us. We just don't see us going back to 9%. But we also think the path to 2%, which is what the Federal Reserve is targeting, 
is not going to be as smooth as we want it to be. We think we get there in 2024. However, it's likely going to be with some pain. Why do I say this? Let's talk about those two services side of inflation, starting with wages. This is the Atlanta Fed's wage tracker, which looks at what the average wage growth is across the broad economy. And you can see it peaked uh, here in 2021. This is the great resignation when everyone was quitting their jobs and since then has fallen, but now most recently is sidetracking its way through. So we think wages is not showing the same fall in wages as it saw the increase. A simple way to digest this is once you give an employee a wage increase, it's hard to undo it until you fire them. And given the dynamics of a strong job market, even today, we think this component of inflation is going to be a little sticky. This will likely start to dissipate sometime in the second half of 2024. But this is one reason why we don't think getting to 2% is going to be instantaneous, much more of a year end story. The second is on the rental prices. Uh, and for that, we're gonna use this home price to give you a sense of how we're looking at this. On this chart here, we're looking at two items here. We're looking at home, existing home sale prices and then new home sale prices. I want you to look at this. So look at the blue line. The new home sale prices has actually fallen in comparison to existing home sale prices, which has fallen and then just came right back. One of the things that you can think about is, and this is the equivalent in how inflation gets measured for rent, is that if you are in an existing home and have the benefit of low mortgage rates, why would I move? If you're lucky enough to have that, you're unlikely to move. So what we saw is given low inventory, existing home buyers and or sale prices has essentially plateaued. It hasn't really fallen off. However, if you are in the home building business and you've built all these homes and mortgage rates doubled, you've had to lower your prices in order to sell those new homes. Now, inflation does not track new home prices. Instead, it tracks rental equivalent. But the same story applies. If you look at existing rental leases, which typically go from 12, 18, or 24 months, those quite haven't fallen. But new rental leases that are coming into play have seen their prices fall. So on this front, we think that in the second half of 2024, as more of the existing leases come due and new leases that are at a lower price come in, that should help inflation come closer to the Fed's target. So the net story in inflation is the worst is truly behind us in our view. However, the path to 2% is going to be a little bumpy and we're gonna get there closer to the end of 2024. This tells me that the market thinks that we are done with inflation and the Fed is gonna cut interest rates in March, but the Fed is not so sure. And for us, the data is not as clear. So expect a bumpy path potentially should the Fed not cut interest rates as per what the market is expecting. Let's take this now and look at the economy. So we got a view on inflation. Let's pivot and look at the economy and answer that question. And the very first one that I'm gonna answer is, are we in a recession? Because depending on where I am in the country, I get asked this question quite often. When I think about, yes, there's a way to look at the gross domestic production, which tracks our economic growth. But another way to do that is just, let's look at the job market. Here's the unemployment chart, and you can see it's sitting near all-time decade lows. We're sitting at an unemployment number, which historically has not necessarily tied with a recession. In fact, we added 2.3 million jobs in 2023. I don't know about you, but I've never seen a recession that starts with adding 2.3 million jobs. And so it tells me that the current state of the economy remains relatively robust. However, that's looking backwards. That doesn't quite address the question of where are we headed on the economy? And for that, we're gonna look at where are the job openings? And that gives me a view into the, uh, the future of the economic growth. So let's take a look at, I mentioned 2.3 million jobs being added in 2023. 
Another way to look at this data is to see how many open jobs exist for those that are in the job market seeking a job to gain from. And you can see here at the peak, there were 12 million jobs. I don't know about you, but on Friday nights, I like to peruse the local Target. And previously, when I went to the Target, there were always all these signs, job wanted. You likely have experienced similarly of open job wanted signs across. The most recent visit that I had didn't quite have those same job opening signs. And that's telling me that the number of open jobs available is dissipating. At the peak, there were 12 million jobs open. Today, there are roughly 8 million jobs. It's still quite a strong job market, but not at the same level as it was a year ago. So that's what that piece is telling me. So the market is slowing down. We are also seeing the number of jobs added, while well, 2023 to 2.3, the pace of it has clearly slowed. In 2022, in comparison, 4.7 million jobs were added. So you could see 2.3 in comparison to 4.7 is at a slower pace. This is one of the key things keeping inflation high. So what we're going to look for is how is the consumer, which is the engine of the US economy, doing in regards in this market environment. And so let's take a look at the US consumer. What we're showing on this chart is excess savings. And why do we focus on the consumer, by the way? We focus on the consumer because the US consumer drives 75% of US economic growth through purchasing things. My, my visit to Target is in, in some essence, at least that's how I tell myself, is to support the US economic growth. Because when we spend, the US economy continues to grow. And the way we can spend is if I've got excess cash in order to make those spending dollars. This chart here looks at excess savings, which is my income that I earn minus any expenditures that I need in order to sustain ongoing monthly bills. You can see at the 2021, the early parts post the pandemic and all that stimulus, Consumers with the inability to go anywhere and or spend that money were sitting on a huge saving, net excess savings. Since then, higher inflation, higher cost of goods has certainly taken a bite out of that consumer's excess savings. And now for bottom 80% of income profiles, most consumers have burned through that. Only the top 20% of income earners are sitting on excess cash. So this gives us concern because what we're seeing is that the consumer is in a less um, resilient position than they were, let's say, a year ago when they had some extra money to spend around and boost economic growth. The other part is that not only have they spent excess savings, they've also taken on credit card debt. And we know credit card debt comes at a much higher cost regarding the interest that gets applied to it. So when I apply the open credit card balances times the interest you have to pay, you can see that it has exceeded pre-pandemic levels. And again, this tells me that the consumer is not in the same state as we start 2024 as they were two years ago, at least. So the question is, when you see this chart, you may say, oh my goodness, are we headed for a 2007-like scenario? Is the consumer strapped such that should the economy slow, is it going to be a really bad recession potentially? And here's potentially good news on that front. Yes, the consumer is strapped. Yes, the consumer has run out of that excess savings and is taking on that additional spending on their credit cards. However, when I look at the total household debt, the blue line, which includes mortgage and or any other consumer debt, it is still well below total pre-pandemic levels. And the key reason is we know anyone that's had a mortgage has likely refinanced, in fact, less than 10% of mortgages outstanding are above three and a half percent, which tells me that most consumers are still able to pay their debt, but the ability to spend in the future has clearly been diminished relative to two years ago. What does all this mean? The consumer today is not in the same condition as it was two years ago, which means that the potential for an economic slowdown and or a recession exists 
However, any recession that we potentially may face is unlikely to be anything like what we've experienced in either 2008 or 2020, which were much more devastating and deep. We're expecting if we have one, it's likely to be shallow. Another reason we think that the economic recession, again, I don't know, it's not a certainty. We could potentially have the economy just flow through. Another reason that if it is happens that it may not be as deep is this chart here. While the consumer is pulling back, we are seeing that government spending has continued to essentially soften any slowdown from the consumer side. We're tracking government spending and the far right hand side, you can see Inflation Reduction Act, as well as the Chips Manufacturing Act, which brings back production, a very necessary thing, brings back production of the AI chips that are used in every item that we likely touch supports the economy as the overall consumer pulls back. This government spending chart, though, always brings the question up of, shouldn't we be worried about our debt? How is this going to impact our economy? And yes, we are seeing the interest we have to pay on our debt as the Fed has raised interest rates start to go up as a rel relative to our GDP. So what's this uh, uh, chart looking at? It's really looking in the green bars is the US economic growth as measured by GDP. And the black line is the interest expense that you have to pay as a percentage of GDP. And you can see we are sitting right where we are in the uh, on the same levels as we had seen previously in the 90s. So what's the solution here? There's two ways to address this conundrum we face. One, we grow the economy at a greater pace such that the growth of our economy is able to sustain the cost that it has taken in order to spur that growth. That's one, grow the economy faster to be able to pay that uh, cost of the debt. The second is you cut uh, spending through a variety of different programs and or raise taxes as the second combination. Regardless, I want us to first look at our eye from 90s to today. The question of will the cost of our interest cause economic um, you know, depression? You could see in the 90s, we were in a similar bind. We were able to grow the economy and thus sustain the cost of the interest as percentage of our total economy. So that's that is a potential. It doesn't mean immediately that this is going to be an implosion as it relates to our debt. The second, though, however, in the short term, we don't see this as an immediate concern, which is why politicians are getting away with this. However, in the long run, or even in the intermediate run, we do see this as a potential issue, and it will likely be addressed by either of those two scenarios. Key conclusion, yes, government spending needs to be curbed, but in the short term, as you can see back in the 90s, it doesn't mean death or demise on an immediate basis, but certainly something that needs to be addressed on the intermediate basis. So with that, we looked at the inflation front, the worst is behind us, we looked at the economy, and yes, the potential for a recession still remains. We don't see necessarily just because the stock market made an all-time high doesn't mean that it's all clear, but if we have one, we just don't see a terrible one like 2008 or 2020. So what does this mean from an investments perspective? The very first chart I want to talk about from an opportunity and the risk is 2023, we saw interest rates we had never seen in a decade. And many investors, in fact, took $6 trillion off the markets and or the sidelines and went into cash investments. CDs and or money market funds saw a total increase of $6 trillion. Now, one of the concerns we have is having too much cash parked for too long as it relates to your overall investment goals. And what we're tracking here is cash, stocks, bonds, and a broadly diversified 60-40 portfolio one year after the Fed is done raising interest rates in light blue and five years after it's done raising interest rates. You can see in every instance, cash tends to trail. And the simple thing is, if the Fed is done raising interest rates, and it's likely is, we don't know when it's going to cut interest rates, but it's likely done raising them, then 
your bonds and your stocks tend to do better. Why do bonds do better? Because bond prices start to appreciate as existing bondholders have a more valuable investment than lower rated, lower uh, interest rate related bonds that are being issued in the marketplace. But cash doesn't benefit from that aspect in the same way as bonds would. Similarly, stocks, which also gets a relief from lower cost of doing business, also tends to do better. And you can see, in fact, much of those gains comes in that first year after the Fed is done raising rates. The key question here is, if you have excess cash that sits on the sideline for too long, likely an opportunity cost to consider and not necessarily this you know, cash is king in perpetuity saying that exists given, again, we've not seen 5% interest rate, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't also come with an opportunity cost or risk. Another is, what about this technological innovation? What does this mean for the markets? We think we're in the infancy stages. Take a look at personal computers and how it added to the US economic growth on a five-year average. The same with the internet. We think artificial intelligence is expected to add similar productivity growth in the US and the global economy. This is why we invest. We invest not for the things we know now, for all the things that we aren't even aware of that are likely going to be headed our way. This is why stock investors get rewarded. And we think, again, early stages of what artificial intelligence can do and likely to benefit the markets in the long run. But having said that, one of the key risks on the contra side of this is investors need to understand how your portfolio is invested if you are what we call as a passive investor. So if you just buy the index, know how your portfolio is composed of. The seven stocks that I mentioned earlier, you can see on the far left-hand side, now make up 30% of the S&P 500 index. I don't know about you, but if somebody told me seven stocks make up a third of my portfolio, I'd want to know is, that may not be the way I thought it was diversified. In fact, these seven stocks, when compared to the global stock market, take a look on the right-hand side. These seven stocks are larger than all stocks in Japan, France, China, and UK put together. This sort of gives us some pause. We know that no trend continues into perpetuity. So the key message from this is know what you own and that if you have a portfolio that's fully passively invested, you may want to consider adding, whether it's geographical diversification and or size and style diversification and or some active management as a way to round out your portfolio. In fact, if you own those classic dividend payers that weren't keeping up pace, we like them even more so as a way to balance out how the U.S. stock market is inherently built up. The last slide I have, and then I promise I'll stop talking. One of the things that I think we can all say, rarely do I get to use the word guaranteed on a client event, uh, is it's likely we're going to see some volatility as a result of election years. Elections are going to be emotional and it tugs our way in different states. And you can see here on this chart, what we have shown you here is the government control and how stock market performs under different government control. When it's fully Republican, it's red. So that's Senate, House, and the presidency. When it's fully um, blue or Democratic, you can see the other way around. But you'll notice the first observation I want us to make is majority of the time, the government control is divided. 60% of the time, it is split. And the markets, in fact, like this. I don't know if it's because you can't do too much harm. I don't know how you look at it. But regardless, the stock market does not look at the, the world in a blue or red lens. It looks through a green lens. It looks to see, can companies continue to generate business and earn revenues? and not necessarily reacting based on current pre presidential wins or what's happening in that cycle. So in this front, it is very important we remove our emotions from that as we think about the impact on our long-term goals. With that, I hope this has made sense. I'm going to stop sharing my screen and see if there's any questions or clarifications I can make. 
Um, one of the uh, questions that came in was early on when you were asking about, or when we were talking about the Magnificent Seven, um, and someone said, which companies are those? So I think the later slide that we just showed um, addressed that. So we can go ahead and check that one off. But, um, you know, maybe it would be um, prudent to just spend a little bit more time on that subject of just saying with it, with those companies being such major drivers and with the expectation of AI having such a big contribution in the future, um, you know, how does a investor decide how much it wants, how much they should have allocated to such few holdings? Yeah, there's two, two new ways to think about that question. Uh, first, if you likely are, you've got the benefit of time, 20 plus years, right? Uh, having a significant growth allocation within your portfolio may make sense. The closer you are to retirement and or drawing assets from it, as an example, NVIDIA, which is one of the chip makers that has benefited and was the best performing stock up 230%, you're going, that sounds great. Let me contrast that with the year before when it was down 95%. You could see for most clients that are at or near retirement, that may not be a ride that's appropriate given that a volatility of that measure can wreak havoc on your overall goals that you need to support your lifestyle. So I'd say look at time horizon as one aspect. The second is we want to be considerate about how much you're paying for these stocks and how much the markets have already priced in what is expected from these stocks. And this is where we get some pause. Yes, these stocks over the long run are likely to benefit from that artificial intelligence trend, as I mentioned, in driving productivity growth. However, if the markets have already priced in a perfection-like scenario, then we want to not be overweight those companies. And this is where, rather than passively being invested, we want to look at each company, look at their sales, know exactly what is being priced in and make those evaluations, sort of a blend across the two. So know the stocks, where and how much have they been rewarded so far, so you're not buying expensive stuff, and two, align it with your time horizon and a blend between these two. And this is where precisely Lindsay, you and team are building those investment related goals, going back and tying it up with your personal time frame and goals is far more important than saying, gosh, I wish I had you know, a portfolio that was made up of all NVIDIA stocks, which was the winner in 2023, but also a great loser in 2022. While we're talking about, um, you know, the market pricing things in, so in that example, we were saying that we're pricing in future earnings in today's, um, in some of the stock prices that were, or stock values that we're seeing there. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what the market is pricing in as far as interest rate movements relative to what we're actually hearing from some of the um, kind of crumbs that the Fed has been dropping. In fact, I think the Fed has been a bit more clearer this time. So the market is expecting interest rate cuts starting in March of 2024. In fact, that's just two months around the corner. The Fed has told us no such thing. The Fed has stated that they're likely to start cutting interest rates by June or July of this year at the earliest, unless they get this all clear signal from inflation. Right, so it's the, yes, inflation is completely under control. Uh, if so, then the maybe, maybe the Fed starts early, but right now markets thinks March cut, Fed is telling us July. And I think this gulf between those months of our entire quarter, if the market doesn't see that first rate come, then you're likely going to see some of the early winners in the stock market give some of it back as a result of what has been priced in, both from the equity side as well as the bond side. So yes, there's a bit of a differential between a little bit of, I'd say, exuberance from the markets uh, relative to the, what the Fed has so far communicated to us. And some of the interesting things about market drivers, we talked a little bit about the volatility, um, you know, and how much of that is, is driven by that, the emotional side. Um, but there's a lot of it, too, that gets driven by just news, 
things that we're hearing. So one of the questions that just came in is very specific to um, to electric vehicles and some of the issues that I've been having in cold weather. And so maybe we could talk about not so much the impact of what's expected for that particular sector, but about the how you know how the news or headlines rather really impact some of this volatility that you showed in that emotional chart that you referenced, um, and how as investors we can pay attention to the headlines, but also just make sure that we're not overreacting or making you know kind of too extreme of adjustments when we hear some of the you know those those constant headlines that are being pushed at us. So the first thing I'll state is that there will be no shortage of headlines here on onwards. It was a conversation you and I were having before we started this webinar. This is the new normal, right? This is the world we will live in and it's likely going to be full speed of information coming at us. I said information, not facts information coming our way and not being able to decipher which one should I really focus in on which one is not. So that's the first part. This is likely the new norm of how we live and how we consume uh, data. A way to see this outside of that volatility chart is the consumer confidence. When we enter 2023, consumer confidence, which measures a state of how do you feel about the economy, that includes the stock markets and a variety of different things, it sat in the toilet, uh, Lindsay. There's no other way to describe it at the start of the year. And yet the market continued to do well. So you could see how we feel about things across a variety of different headlines. We all were waiting for a recession that never quite came, never quite manifested itself. And I could see that in the consumer confidence. And we, 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 you know, sort of, in fact, our earlier slide at the same time earlier ago, we said, do not equate how we feel to how the markets can perform. They are very different things. And so I think 2023 is a classic example of how we were surprised of why the markets continued to climb, even though we as investors did not feel confident and comfortable about the economy. So yes, take a look at that. And that classically, by the way, when consumer confidence sits at the bottom, one year stock return thereafter tends to be double digits. When we feel great about the economy, it's the polar opposite. So I, you know, I don't know if it directly relates to ongoing headlines, but it just tells us focus on your goals rather than the barrage of information that is likely always going to be headed our way. And with an election year, there will be no shortage of that, especially in 2024. Um, go just a couple more questions. So, um, you know, we're talking a little bit about consumers and how, um, you know, there's a disconnect sometimes between what we're feeling and what's happening in the economy. But um, we did talk about being the consumers becoming more strapped. So when we think about how the consumer has been able to um, really go out there and spend and help drive, um, you know, some of this economic recovery that we've seen, what are we really watching for as we see, um, you know, savings getting um, getting diminished, credit card debt rising? Um, you know, at what points are we starting to see red flags? It sounds like now we're transitioning back to a more balanced state, but I want to make sure we address that. Um, you know, we start to hear about these deaths rising. At what point does that become a concern? So it becomes a concern. Right now, it is one of the reasons why we're balancing our outlook with the potential for not all things are rosy. So that's the first part uh, on why many in fact have pivoted to saying the economy is just gonna be just fine. We have no recession on the horizon. And we see this as a, it's a bit more nuanced than that. Overall, I think the consumer is definitely going to be headed to less spending than where it was previously. That, that's, I think, uh, regardless of, um, you know, the, the state of the overall economy. The one reason why we feel comfortable on the fact that the economy is unlikely to have a big, deep recession, look at the job market. The reason the consumer continues to spend is that the job market at 8 million open jobs, even though not all of them are great quality jobs, gives a sense of resiliency to the consumer. Should we see that job market data turn around, 
it becomes the starting domino. I think of it logically, psychologically, until I have a job, I, you know, even though I may be strapped, I feel confident to continue spending, be it on my credit card in order to may perhaps overextend ourselves. But the minute we start to see job losses and or those open jobs get eliminated at a greater pace, that's when you see consumers even pull back further sharper. And that's when we see the shock to the economy, the equivalent of the economic bicycle, right? We need to keep a little speed. The minute the economy as a bicycle slows down too far, and that's the shock of, I don't have a job, gosh, I should pull back spending, that's when we head into a recession. That's what we're watching for. So watch with the job numbers as a way to get a sense for, can the consumer continue its confidence, even though it's slower, but if you see that pivot, you likely are going to see some type of a softening in that economic data. Long-winded answer, but watch for the job numbers is the, the cue. I know, and we hit on so many of these points already. So, um, you know, it's a little bit of just kind of circling back to, to some of the um, <clears throat> points that you made earlier in, in the webinar. Um, the final question is probably the most loaded one. Um, it's really, it's about geopolitical risk. We, speaking of headlines, there's, you know, no shortage of concerns when we see things that are going on around the world. Um, and it seems that, you know, some of these conflicts that have been going on for a longer period of time, um, you know, we kind of don't hear about as much. We hear a lot about, you know, China's economy slowing. We now have um, activity in the Red Sea. So what are the things from, a, you know, outside the U.S. do we think about as carrying, um, you know, imminent risk in 2024? I know it's a loaded question. So no, this is something we watch for continually. So um, unfortunately, I don't think I've ever entered in the 23 years of investing a year without risks. And as a reminder, this is why we get rewarded in the markets. If we had the all clear signal at all times, we wouldn't enjoy the returns that we do in the equity markets. So yes, risks never feel good, but this is why we get the rewards of outsized cash plus returns, both in the bond and the stock markets. I'm gonna start there. What are the risks that we are watching for? We do continue to watch potentially the expansion of the conflict in the Middle East is concerning. If it expands to include larger players beyond what we're seeing in the Red Sea with Iran and or other countries getting involved in any larger scale, that's likely to cause, remember that supply chain issue? it's likely to come back. And we're already seeing that. We're seeing that in the, the timing that it's taking for shipments to make it across because they'll have to reroute elsewhere and or supply chain disruptions being priced into goods, causing inflation to potentially come back into the forefront. So that's one key risk that we watch for uh, very closely. Having said that, the one sort of difference today is that as a consumer, what are we spending the most of our money on? We're still saying that the consumer is spending much more heavily on services, this life of experiences, than the good side of things. Experiences aren't impacted in the same way as buying stuff that's sitting on a ship that's stuck somewhere. So that equation shift has is likely to temper any inflationary impact not to the same scale as it was felt when we were all on Wayfair, you know, trying to renovate our houses all at once to give you sort of an example of the difference. So that's one, watch for the Middle East. It is something that we could potentially impact inflation. The second uh, potential risk is what happens with China and the real estate market that's in there, their economy slowing down, and what does this mean for the global economy? You know, previously the domino was if China falls, then every other country is likely to fall. What we're seeing surprisingly, but this may be news to many investors, is that in the emerging markets, China has fallen on its dominance. Previously, it used to be something like 35% of the overall emerging markets. As China's economy has slowed and its um, stock market has even shrunken, Countries like India have taken greater dominance. So in some ways, we are watching, yes, for a greater China slowdown impact, but we have benefited from other countries taking its 
place. And so the net effects, again, aren't as dramatic as it was a few years ago when China was the dominant theme next to the US. So that's a concern, but balanced out. The last thing that I watch for is truly geopolitical risk in the US. And again, the headlines are likely to be lightning rod in some instances. And I can I always worry from the emotional aspect, right? It is hard for an investor to not be swayed emotionally, regardless of which side of the fence you sit on. And that watching our emotional uh, balance in a year like 2024 is going to be critical. Now that's not necessarily related to what the markets may do, but how we react to the news is something that I think we must address head on because in a year like 2024, watch out. It's going to be sensationalized headlines that are likely aimed at moving most of us in one direction or the other, whether or not that's helpful to our, your overall investment goals, um, that's to be determined by you and to be not swayed necessarily by the most alarming um, news that's coming our way. So watch for the Middle East, watch for China, because it is, while it has become a less dominant player, it is something that ties the global economies. And last but not least, a watch for headline risks from the geopolitical countries in the U.S., Something to the periphery, if I may add one more thing, is going to be as it relates to, you know, not getting caught up in Bitcoin, right? So now there's ETFs uh, and, and or the potential for when we see these things reverse. Ensure that, again, your portfolios reflect your long-term goals and not necessarily something that is catching the most recent headline. So I use the asset bubble that could potentially, again, come back into the speculative forefront as potentially the other side of headline mania that can catch our attention. Well, yeah, that's a lot of, uh, you know, heavy, heavy comments to end on. Maybe we want to just wrap up with... Um you know, just revisiting that the outlook for for this year, if we said, you know, fast forward, and we were talking on, um, you know, December 22nd, 2024, um, you know, what do we think we're going to see from from broad indexes this year? Is it going to feel similar to 2023? Similar to 2022? You want to make a call? I think the first thing we can say is, um, less than 2023. I don't think any of us is expecting 25%. If I'm wrong, I'll take it gladly in this instance. But I think temporary expectations as it relates to the equity markets, given the strong momentum we have seen. What we have seen is stock prices have risen, earnings need to catch up. At some point, you're paying for the stocks to make the money it has promised us. You cannot have this disconnect for a very long time. So the stock prices have risen. We need to see earnings catch up to stock prices. So temper your return expectations. I'd say if we get, we're somewhere in the consensus of a single digit returns uh, to potentially in the low double digits, unlikely to measure up to 2023. Bonds we see as a, it's a very simple instrument. The starting yield on a bond is a great reflection of what you can expect on the next four, five, and or the maturity of your bond. So if it's sitting something in that four, five, six percent, that's what we should expect going forward, more predictable than the stock side of the equation. Temper on stocks expected to be somewhere in that coupon range for bonds over the long run. You can count me as wrong. Like I said, I'm happy to be wrong on the other side of the upside to stocks should it surprise us again in 2024. But I'd rather start with tempering our expectations. No, I appreciate that. And I very much appreciate your time today. So thank you for um, spending the last hour with us. We really appreciate all of your thoughts. And we look forward to um, 2024 being another interesting year in the economy and the stock market. Stay safe and have a great year. All right, bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye.